I think I'll pick up some of the points that you raised just now. And also, sorry, I'm Tim Hussein, uh, not Martin Vinter, and I'm going that way, that way. Sorry, if I'm a bit all over the place, I'm sorry, I had a very delayed plane last night. So, and I also have a little bit of a, uh, yeah, some tiredness from that. So, I'm going to pick up some of those points. But your questions that you raised earlier, was it, was it about technology? I thought it was about media planning and niche supplies and media supply. It's a bit of both, really. Yeah. So, and then the challenge is with that is the fact that no agency can know everybody that's out there. You know, and also you talk about the thing, the thing about the media plan, for me, it's less about whether they know all the niche players. It's more about the fact that most of the people they put on the media plan are ones they got rebate to deal with. And that's the biggest problem, is the fact that the rebate <coughs> structure in the UK, certainly it's not in the US, I think biases planning decisions much more than whether it's a niche player. And me, I've worked at big companies, I've worked at small independents. So when you're the small independent, trying to get on that media plan is a real, real hassle. I think that's why the transparency into it comes you know, across the chain. OK, um, so I run the uh, tech consultancy practice, uh, really on the marketing tech side. Um, I've worked at Victory for a couple of years now. Uh, my background, though, is media owner side, so AOL for many years, was at Sky for many years, also running big sort of trading desks, so helping to power a lot of the media agency trading desks. And my team uh, are people who come from running trading desks. So Matt, who's the head of Europe, ran Amnet for a number of years. Um, a lot of my team is sort of big programmatic traders. And I suppose the first thing I'll put out about, just to talk about the tech practice for two secs before I go into it, is um, whilst we are staff with people who have done it for a number of years, we do not buy media, sell media, sell technology, or do those things in those areas. So we do keep our independence and impartiality across it. But it's really important when we're discussing things like in-housing and outsourcing to have people who've actually done it and run it because a lot of the pain and a lot of the considerations is, you know, how do you operate something on a Friday night when that campaign's supposed to go live and all your traffickers have gone home and the segment's not building? Those sorts of considerations as you think about this area. So I'm going to talk about in-housing and outsourcing. How many people in their businesses, I know from different agency, advertisers, sorry, have had a discussion or there's discussions going on about whether they should in-house or outhouse? Okay. So I spoke in Spain on Tuesday. It was actually quite interesting that actually, in Spain, not many advertisers actually had that discussion. So I do think it's much more of a UK, American conversation than it is in some more developed, other developed European markets. <coughs> but it is certainly, <laughs> I would say, it's certainly one of the top sort of two or three things this year, certainly that people are talking around in the area. So what do I mean by in-housing? Quite simply, taking direct control of an element of marketing by an advertiser. Whilst it's simple, it deliberately doesn't say the word programmatic or digital in there. Because I think what's happening in the industry, and we'll talk in a moment, is that they're automatically saying in-housing equals taking digital in-house. And I'm going to talk to those points in a moment. Outsourcing, as probably most of you do today, basically paying someone else to do it for you. So, question. so let's start as that, as, as the foundation sort of talking through as we go in. So I mentioned very briefly around the programmatic side, but why is there so much focus on programmatic in-housing? I'm going to talk through two reasons in a moment. But the first reason, uh, a couple of years ago, obviously the ANA investigation into the transparency practices with firm decisions and Stephen and the ANA over there uh, went into that. And that really opened up the world in digital. And we're seeing a lot more people wanting to take control as they drive into it. And so we're seeing questions come out from the likes of P&G. We're seeing tech stack prices come in. So there's lots of movement. And if you think about the amount of money now that's going into digital and suddenly into programmatic, it's a significant revenue line. And so that you know, obviously gives you a good consideration to think about it. But when we talk about programmatic, though, in-housing of the operations of programmatic and addressing media transparency issues are not codependent. They're not the same thing. We see lots of advertisers who say, we're going to in-house programmatic because we don't trust our agency anymore. And whilst there is a little bit of crossover into that, the you know, bad analogy I give is it's a little bit like being worried that your house is going to be burgled. And instead of putting in a burglar alarm, you actually move your entire house somewhere else. It's a lot of hassle and a lot of pain for something when there's an easier way to go around it. So the first thing I say is, when we talk about in-housing, it's not all programmatic. The second one is that in-housing based on transparency issues might be right, and there might be some logic for it, but it shouldn't automatically be assumed that that is the best approach. There's many cheaper and more efficient ways of addressing that. 
And the other thing is, as some of you put your hands up, is there is a lot of noise about this in the industry at the moment. You can't stop reading. You know, when Forrester comes out and gives a report about in-housing, you know that it's got to a point where you know, it's become sort of mainstream conversation. Um, and when there's a lot of noise about anything in the digital community, and I've worked in it for a long time, I get a little bit concerned. Because the higher the noise, the harder it is to actually understand what is the best course. And you suddenly realize that there is a lot of commercial benefit to many organizations on the in-housing question, whether that's not in-housing or taken in the in-house. And the reason that's important, we talked about um, sort of media transparency and things, areas. The very first thing that we say really is, is be very cautious of biased advice in this space. Because there are lots of companies who are changing their business models, who historically would have been maybe independent consultants and people like that, who are now moving into this space. And you need to be careful about where they come from. So, you know, the two things into it is bias is one of the things we've got to be really careful of. So every time somebody comes to you and gives you a piece of advice, what is the reason? What is their benefit? What's their commercial gain out of that piece of advice? But also how we are biased and how we receive information on confirmation bias as well. Because if you are, if you're the head of digital in an advertiser and somebody comes to you and says, oh, would you like to in-house all of digital and own that whole area and build a really big team up? Lots of people go, yeah, hey, that's a great career plan. I'm going to become more important in my organization. I'm going to get more power. I'm going to progress in my career. And we do see that a lot. And I'm not saying it's the right, no, it's the wrong decision to do. But it is something that certainly, if you're in that position that you can look agnostically at digital in other areas, is to always try and take a step back, even to people in your own team sometimes go, well, I know you really, really want to drive into the most latest programmatic tech piece that's driving out there, but does it, how much more sales does it actually drive for us? So these are the two key things that we sort of think about. But the three key reasons that we see uh, when it comes into uh, in-house and business cases that's coming out at the moment is, one is we need to address programmatic transparency and hidden margin issues. So that I mentioned at the beginning, um, you know, yes, it can do that, and it is a way of getting control of it, but it doesn't have to be your first option. We want to be more efficient with our money. We see this one come out from two areas, big, uh, let's call them non-marketing specialist consultancies, who go in at a very high CFO level and say, if you take programmatic in-house, you will drive a 30% efficiency and you'll save loads of money on it. Uh, and they give that advice and the procurement get it and go, fantastic, we can show a saving. And then people like me and my team get given a bit of advice and the advertiser goes, great, could you show us how we can get these savings? And we have to go, well, actually, we think it's probably going to cost you more in the next two to three years than leaving it with your media agency. So there is a, you know, Again, it can drive efficiencies, and we'll talk about over the time period. And the last one, the industry is going to be even more digital in the future, and we need to own and take more control of it. 100% agree with all these three, and especially the last one. But again, there's stages and there's progress. If we talked about full in housing, that's an end game. There's steps that you can take as a business organization to get there. OK, so some considerations to take into account, first of all. <coughs> And this is specifically coming back to that question about programmatic in-housing, because it is, you never hear, I haven't seen a single press article that says TV in-housing, or radio buying in-housing, or even media planning in-housing. But that's in-housing just as much as programmatic in-housing. So the first thing I'd say is, and I'm, you know, I'm sure you're you know, really aware of this, but you know, online as an overall medium itself is only one element of the marketing strategy. And the reason that's important is, we only have one customer at a time. You know, we don't, obviously you've got more than one customer, but one customer will engage with our executions, our media executions across each of these points. So they'll be exposed to a TV campaign, they'll be exposed to a radio campaign. And if we're doing proper holistic planning across it, you'll be working how they coordinate across it. And Tim's going to talk a little bit about sort of ROI measurement in a bit, coming on. So if you were to take online out completely, just simple things about how are you doing that planning process? Is your media agency now doing the planning for offline media and you're doing the planning for online internally? So there's those types of considerations. But it gets more complicated because when we hear about programmatic, which is where the buzzwords are, programmatic is only one of the online channels. So search, social, sponsorship, content partnerships, and programmatic. So let's just say, for example, we take that out. Again, you have to think about, well, if you're running digital campaigns, search and social, 
How is that activity? How are budgets and things being managed across here? So it's not as simple as just saying take it out. And this is where it comes back to the bias. Because there are lots of companies who will make lots of money if you in-house. And I'm not saying the advice they give you is wrong. I think it might be just a little bit biased sometimes. That taking this out, they will talk to you about all the benefits. Oh, we can get transparency. Oh, we can save money. And how you can take that out. But they won't talk to you about the downsides. How do you do a planning process? How do you move budget halfway through a media activity? Let's say, for example, you suddenly realize that social is driving much better engagements you know, much better KPIs, how do you do halfway throughout the month, take money out of social and move it into programmatic if you've taken that all out? Or vice versa. It's some of those operational challenges that are worth considering about. And I'll give you the three examples. This is some stuff that we did just to try to explain to one of our clients how programmatic six versus two of the other big channels. So the first one is on media supply. So the, less, the lower the number of media partners that you need to get the scale that you need for your business, the easier it is to in-house. So search, there is one supply point in Western Europe pretty much for all of it. So it's fairly straightforward. Um, social, yes, there's lots of second tier ones, but two or three main supply points will give you pretty much most, of, most advertisers the reach that they need to, hit, to reach their customer base. Programmatic, in each market, probably 100 plus supply points that you've got to get into. So there isn't a thing like just one big exchange, you can just go and buy the inventory off. On the technology, again, the less the number of technology, the easier it is to in-house. Search is one or no pieces of technology. You can go and use AdWords itself and go and buy it from that. Um, not two pieces of tech really for social, so you could just go and use Facebook straight away. And programmatic, four to six pieces of tech, pretty much as you're trying to run across it in that area. And the last consideration for in-house and online media is market conditions. The more stable the market, the easier it is to in-house. So search we know is very, very stable, maybe too stable, and we maybe need to disrupt that slightly. Um, social is high stability with leading companies. So yes, there's a lot of change through the second tier, but the main ones have been around for a bit. Programmatic is really, really unstable. What the industry is going to look like in the next two years to where it is now, uh, I've got five minutes. Good luck with that. OK, I'll talk really fast. Um, OK, so, so there's sort of key consideration to think about. And then when you're actually thinking about it, though, programmatic is, sorry, not programmatic, digital in-housing is not really just about should I in-house or should I not in-house. There is a gradient of options you can do. So you have, you know, you're sort of holding company with a trading desk. You've got your agency of record. You could take it out and put it in a digital specialist. So again, there's lots of you know, really, really good digital specialists out there. You know, we've had some of them being acquired recently, but people like Jellyfish are the ones out there. Or what you could do is use an agency of record and have a digital specialist. So you've got different options out there. You could then start to in-house one or more digital channels. So you could in-house social, you could in-house search, you could in-house programmatic. You don't have to be programmatic. You can pick your options out. But not just in housing um, the channels, you could also in house the media functions. So, if you think of the channels as execution cha strategies, you've also got everything from media planning, sort of strategy at the top, right down to ad ops as a more operational delivery. Any of those functions in between that, from programmatic planners and stuff, you could in house one or two of those functions. So, some advertisers we know have taken ad operations in house, but they've left the media planning and buying with the media agency. Some have gone the other way. And they've got media planners within their own organizations. And they actually let the agencies do the execution or a third party. Uh, you can in-house one of the media functions we're talking about there. Or you can take it all in-house and do the whole lot, certainly across digital in those areas. So we're not coming to you say, what is the right option? What we're trying to say today really is, is there is options out there. And it's not as singular as going to do one of the sort of key avenues out there. So a couple of points. This is generally the types of things that we ask our clients. Um, and really just to ask them sort of more, um, you know, to, to get them thinking about their businesses and how they would do it. So a key one. Will you be able to evaluate the performance of the internal team as rigorously as an external agency? Uh, I'm not from the client side of the world. I'm from the publisher side of the world. I've worked at Victory for a couple of years now. That was one of the ones that my observations of working very closely with clients are when it's an internal team that does it, that's maybe not under your direct control, versus an external partner, the same level of rigorous checking their work doesn't go on because of internal politics. 
It's very hard to walk over somebody's desk and shout at them for doing a bad job, but I see people do that to media agencies all the time. So it's like different. The other one is, it's a real back office thing here is, how dynamic is your recruitment team ensuring you can maintain talent? Uh, recruitment and finance will probably be the two of the key areas that when you in-house will be the biggest problematic for programmatic in-housing challenges that you can do. And also the timeline. Right now, the buzz is in-housing. Everybody's talking about it, CEOs, CMOs are standing on stage talking about it, it's great. You see P&G announce something and every other CMO runs around and wants an in-housing strategy. It's great. But the question is, is how long is their commitment into this? It takes years to implement and to put it in. So saying now and then 18 months time you walk away or 18 months time the CMO leaves or the CEO leaves, that can really mess up your business in terms of the marketing functions, go back into pitch, you've got to unpick it all. So we're just saying, you know, really trying to get them to think about a long-term commitment to it. And then we'll touch on some of these points, and I know that Stephen's coming up next. Um, I think you're up next, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, so why don't contractual commercial considerations? So a really, really simple one. Um, uh, I'm sure some of you know, uh, the ANA uh, contract, uh, that reads, not the ANA, sorry, the ISBAR contract that we talked about. It's a really good contract, um, and there's stuff that they're doing in that area. But just for example, there's nothing in those in the contracts from ISBAR on that area uh, talks about service level agreements for technology supply. So, for example, if you take some of your functions in house, and your media agency is dependent on those functions to do their job, on the media agency side, what happens if something goes wrong? Uh, what happens if the technology is not working? Who's now at fault for that campaign not delivering, or if budget's gone, or if money has been spent on a publisher that it shouldn't have been spent on? So there is lots and lots of areas that it's not just the technology and programming, it's also the contractual positions behind it. The last couple of points, just to keep Andrew happy. Um, jump on. So, really key one. Is your finance team ready and willing to handle hundreds of publisher relationships if you in-house programmatic? It's a really nice question to go and ask them because, for example, if you have ad server discrepancy numbers when you're delivering out a campaign, media agencies go and negotiate that with a publisher. And they sit down and they put it into the value deal and they bang heads all the time. Is your finance team, one, skilled and resourced enough to go and do that in that area? Two, uh, are you able to get the optimal commercial conditions with multiple vendor relationships? Certainly, if you're a smaller single market advertiser, there, might, there is still benefit of the clout of big media agency groups that they can get better deals. Certainly when they're talking about big global suppliers or global media suppliers. And then, you know, are there any other ancillary services that previously performed by the agency? Again, the finance function. You know, finan um, you know, media agencies are generally big financial businesses, arbitrage businesses, and they've got a lot of financial systems running behind it. And that is what you have to get into if you want to start in-housing some of these areas. I think I'll run through this. Um, I say these, these are your slides from before. Uh, monitoring, review, and agreed commercial teams. This is the sort of consideration you should do. You know, checking like the, how the cash flows are working. If you are now doing the media buying on your side, and your media agency is doing some of the other stuff, there is whole changes of invoices and sort of flows throughout that. Um, and then protecting your campaign-related information and first party. How are you making sure that's being used? Okay, and we'll jump past this in the interest of time. Uh, I've mentioned this very briefly before, which is like, you know, it's not just about putting it in, it's also what happens, what happens if the technology goes down. Are you going to go and talk to your IT team to go and resolve this, or do you have to hire in technology people as well as media people to actually run it? Okay, I think the final closing thoughts. So, ask yourself first why you are considering in-housing. It's the most important thing. What is the reason? Are you looking to improve transparency? Are you looking to save money? Out of those three reasons, the third one I think is probably the best reason for it. We want to take more control and own this area, and there's stages to get into that. Do be aware of any advisor who has vested interests to you in housing. And I'm going to be really straight up here. You know, people like Accenture who have moved from being independent consultants to buying and selling media, and people like them and other ones who put people in your organisation to run your business for you have a vested interest in trying to convince you why your media agency is bad and why in-housing is the right strategy. And they are just as biased as any agency trying to get you to put your money in their non-disclosed trading desk. Um, so don't think that just because it's coming from somebody who's not a media agency that they're any less biased in the way that they look at it. Um, 
the higher the level of support that you can get and the long-term support, the better. And the last one is it comes down to the people. It's the biggest challenge or ways to retain good talent and keep people going there. Thank you.